So I'm going to talk about conquering depression because when I was depressed, so many people talked about managing your symptoms and just dealing with depression. And it was like the kind of view where that meant I had to live with it. I just kind of had a, I have depression, I kind of just have to figure out how to work with it. So I kind of just put this picture up as, because most of the time when you think of depression, you think of like healing and dealing with it. But it's like, I want that truck to be depression and that big truck to be me, right? I wanted to be depression and feel better than just managing it and living with it. And uh, so basically uh, the next slide is all you need to know. This is my entire presentation right here. And it's count your blessings. Be grateful for all the wonderful things in your life. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. That's what I heard all the time and it pissed me off. Everyone said, wake up, I'm freaking right here, girl. I'm thankful for the sun, I'm thankful for this. I'm sitting here trying to do all this positive thinking and trying to be grateful, and I was still depressed. So, no, forget that. <laughs> yes, that's not my presentation. So, the reality of depression is there's a million different reasons. You can't just magically snap out of depression. You can't just hope tomorrow's going to be a better day. And so, if you're depressed or you ever struggle with it, don't ever beat yourself up for not being able to positively think your way out of it. I think the positive thinking to try and get over depression can be a trap at times. Um, so I didn't always know all this stuff about depression. I was forced to learn by necessity. I just got obsessed with it because I didn't want to be depressed. But some of my background is I worked at a clinical research facility. I was on Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. I worked for National Alliance for Mental Illness, spoke in front of people about my experience, and got a degree in psychology, and the interesting thing is, all that experience and that knowledge actually wasn't the answer. It didn't show me how to beat my depression, but I did understand a lot of the different aspects. So basically what I want to talk about today is how a parachute revealed the truth about my depression. Surprising number one question I'm always asked by people all the time, and you basically have to believe in this answer if you want to improve. How it isn't your fault if you're depressed, a word about antidepressants. What could be your root cause? And then I got some things of ways to start healing today. So first, I got a little background, some embarrassing stories. But that's what I, uh, it's kind of a blurry picture, but that's kind of more what I used to look like. And uh, just because I guess I got a few comments lately, like one guy, remember I told him I used to be depressed and he was saying like, Hey, you're a pretty white boy or something like that. You can't be depressed. I was like, what is that? What are you talking about? But anyways, uh, yeah, my depression started when I was in about fourth grade. So as a kid, I was doing some weird stuff. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. But like when I was a kid, I like tied a belt around my neck, started suffocating myself, like playing with the idea of killing myself. Uh, one time I wanted to kill myself and I decided to take a whole bottle of melatonin but it was a pretty bad attempt at suicide because I just woke up the next day like with amazing sleep. Felt the best of it, but of course. And I decided like self-harm as a child. So my depression started before anything in my life became difficult. Um, after the death of my brother, I was very suicidal and I uh, abused illegal drugs heavily. And then uh, my brother and sister always liked to joke because Back in the day, they'd open my closet, and the only color shirt I ever wore was black. I had one brown shirt, but I basically had, you know, my hair was dyed black, and all I ever wore was black. And I hit, I hit rock bottom a lot, but there's two times that really stuck out to me. The first time, this is when I didn't know how real depression was. I just kind of was like, oh, it's in your head, it's in your head. I didn't really believe it. But it was a perfect sunny day. And this is when I had like a bullet bike. I was doing all this crazy stuff because I thought, oh, my life, I'm just, my life just sucks. That's why I'm depressed. So I was trying to be a certified skydiver. So it's a perfect day. Me and my friend go. I'm going to jump out of a plane once again. And I remember going up in the plane. I seen the back of the plane. And everyone's like, 
high-fiving each other. And I just remember in that moment, I was just like, I'm not even excited for this. And I, I jumped out of the plane, you know, you're breathing through your teeth, flying through the air. You know, I pull out my shoe, do the little things so you can land. And everyone comes rushing up to me like, yeah, I was it, I was it. And I'm just like, I don't know. Everyone's like, what the hell? This is the first time someone's jumped out of a plane and didn't even enjoy it. And as I was driving home, it's an awkward drive for my friend because he's all pumped up and we went skydiving. I didn't, I wasn't excited at all. And when I got home, that's when I was like, kind of hit reality for me. And I said to myself, I was like, I just went skydiving and I didn't feel anything. So this depression stuff's probably real, right? And my life is so numb, I couldn't even go skydiving and feel any pleasure from it. And I didn't know what to do, and so I just numbed out, and I obviously isolated for days. College was horrible. And then there was one uh, moment in time, I don't really share this very often, because people either don't believe me or that this is too crazy. But there was one time I was isolated for about four days just by myself, just you know, depressed, didn't know what to do. And there was one day where I actually heard, I was so depressed, so out of it, I actually heard voices in my head. And uh, it, was, it was kind of traumatizing a little bit, and I couldn't tell anybody, like, no one's going to believe me and say I heard voices in my head. Because it wasn't just like obsessive loud thoughts, it was like, there's someone in the room here talking to me. So that's how bad my depression was. And then the second, the, the wake up call I really got was I went snowboarding. It was another perfect day. And as we're snowboarding, I get this weird voicemail. And I was already depressed at the time. And it's from my friend's brother. And it's basically the wake up call I got in life. Because I called him back and said, hey, I got this voicemail. And he said, hey, I wanted to let you know that Spencer passed away last night. And at the time, that was my best friend, knew him for 17 years, really the only source of unconditional love I had left. So I was already depressed. My friend just died. I'm, I just, I'm like, I've had enough. And it was, a, it was another awkward drive home in front of the friend I was with. And so about a week or two later, I realized I was like, because at this point, when you're that depressed, suicide is actually a relief. Like, if someone comes up to me and they're depressed, and they're like, hey, they're like, hey, I have suicidal thoughts. I'm just like, yeah, of course. Of course you do. Like, if you're depressed, that's, that's normal. If you're that in pain, you're going to want to kill yourself. And at, at this point, I was like, I'm, I'm going to just kill myself. But instead of killing myself, I actually wrote a letter I made an agreement to myself. I said, I'm going to try everything out there for one year, and if I'm still depressed, I'm going to kill myself. And I meant it. It wasn't just like, yeah, I'm going to kill myself. It was like, I was like, to myself, I was like, TJ, if you're still depressed in a year, I'm going to give you the gift of killing yourself. And that changed everything. Because when I was depressed, I had all these ideas about depression. I thought I knew everything there was, but it was all these false beliefs. And I didn't actually know anything about depression. And just saying I had a year to try everything, it opened up my eyes to every possibility out there. And that's when I took responsibility for my recovery, because no one was going to do this for me. I had one year before I was going to die. So the first thing that I tried was antidepressants, because everyone says, you know, if you're depressed, because Go take antidepressant. How I got off them was a, another nightmare story in, the, in and of itself, but I actually tracked all my mood and my sleep. And basically, I, the medication kind of worked, and I get depressed. They increased my dose, it kind of worked, I get depressed. They kept increasing my dose to eventually 40 milligrams of Celexa, and that's a pretty high dose. And I actually got manic off the Celexa, and I mean, I got, it became crazy. And then they said, oh, since you reacted that way to Celexa, that means you're bipolar. So then the doctor was trying to push lithium on me. 
you know, I tried Wolbutrin and Paxil, all these crazy drugs, and I'm sitting here, like, I don't want to take lithium, I don't want to do this anymore. So I realized that wasn't working. So I tried to just quit Celexa, cold turkey. Yeah, <laughs> not, it's not a smart idea. Uh, I was at an internship and it was so horrible, I had to go home and I fell on the ground and I couldn't move for two hours. The withdrawal was so bad. I was just on the ground, staring at the ceiling, just saying, you gotta get up, you gotta get up. And I, I couldn't get up and I was like, this is, so, this is crazy. So now I'm depressed and now I'm dependent on these medications, but I still had some time before my year was up. And now I know that with depression, a medical diagnosis is really just a guess. And I didn't know this at the time, but there's actually been a lot of warnings that Celexa of dosages of 40 milligrams or more can even cause heart problems and mortality. But to me, it was just, oh, you reacted a certain way, so I was bipolar. So at this point, I'm just I'm messed up and I, I didn't know what to do. So I literally would force myself to get up and I would just kind of like walk down to Barnes and Noble. It's like, uh, and I just go to the bookstore and I just kind of like open up a book and read it. And I just went to Barnes and Noble every day and I started reading random books. And then there's this idea of nutrient therapy. And I mean, back then I was like, that sounds really dumb. But <laughs> at that point I was like, I'm going to kill myself. So I don't care. I'm going to try anything. <laughs> right? So I started messing around with all these uh, nutrients, amino acids, vitamins, and changing my nutrition. And then I was able to use supplements to get off the Celexa. And all of a sudden, for the first time, I'm like, I'm going good. And uh, my friends and family probably hated me because I had this newfound obsession with healthy food. I don't do it anymore. But when I first discovered this, I see someone eating something crappy. Like, don't eat that. Don't eat that. You should eat this. You should eat this. Because for the first time in my life, I was finding real relief from depression rather than just faking it. And so, with depression, there's always root causes. There's always a root cause for what's causing it. And my root causes came down to nutrient imbalances and deficiencies. I didn't have enough omega-3 fats. I had food allergies, sugar sensitivity, and slight adrenal fatigue. And just so you guys can see some raw evidence, that actually that top one, I was already supplementing with vitamin D to get my levels up to 34, so they're way lower before that. And then with uh, supplementation, I got my vitamin D levels up to 66, which they say around 60 to 80 is the proper range. So I was very deficient in vitamin D. My blood test results showed I was deficient in magnesium. I started taking magnesium that quickly, corrected that issue, started sleeping better. And then my test even showed that I was low in DHEA, which is a signal of adrenal fatigue. And at the time, my estrogen was kind of high, so you know, it's some rough times. And uh, so, as, as with the food allergies and sugar sensitivity, at this point, there's all this new information, and I'm trying all these new things, and everyone's like, tell me all the gluten things are bad, like, don't cut out bread, that's stupid, and don't try to eat healthy, it's all dumb, but when I'm depressed, at that point, I just had to block everything out and just trust myself. Because everyone's trying to tell me, like, no, you're not depressed, or no, you can't feel an effect from eating food 30 minutes later. And I just had to say, no, TJ, I know how I feel. I know if I'm depressed or not. So I just quit listening to everybody. I just quit analyzing everything. And so it's very simple. I just did a food allergy test for two weeks. I just cut out gluten and dairy for two weeks. And then at the end of the two weeks, I just ate a bunch of pasta and bread and tested how it affected me. And after I did that, after the two weeks, I actually started feeling more clear and better. And then when I ate the spaghetti and bread and pasta, all of a sudden I get bloated. I am feeling foggy. My heart rate increased. So I was like, okay, I'm probably allergic to gluten. I cut it out. Ever since, and I've been, I feel great. Same thing with dairy, and um, and then sugar. That was one I was like, eh, I don't know, sugars and everything. I don't know about cutting that out. But then I read how this best-selling author, Michael Ellsberg, he overcame his bipolar, his 
lifelong bipolar simply by cutting out sugar. And so I read that and I was like, all right, well, I might as well try cutting out sugar too. And they actually used to think I was a little bipolar because I had a lot of mood swings. I'd, I'd like get up and not sleep for a few days and, and that sort of thing. I cut out sugar, all of a sudden I'm starting to become more stable. And at the time, I was still volunteering helping people with mental illness, and I'm going in there, and while these people are coming in, we're giving them cake and soda and coffee with sugar, and I'm sitting here like, yo, why are we feeding them cake? Like, nobody knows about this stuff. Like, the institutions helping people with mental illness is giving people sugar and poison. And basically, living in the United States, it's, it's not your fault, really, if you're depressed and you don't know why. I mean, this is what the food pyramid used to look like. So if I would have followed what the food pyramid used to tell me to eat, I would be eating bread, rice, and pasta most of the time, which would keep me depressed. And let's just be honest, most people, that's what the food pyramid looks like. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even eating for every reason to be sure that that's just a uh, picture I threw in there, more of a food pyramid I live by today. But anyways, so back when I was so confused and helpless and going to these professionals, I go to a doctor and I was not once asked about my sleep, my diet, my digestion, my vitamin and mineral levels were never tested, my hormones were never tested, and for some reason there's this negative stigma towards the word natural. Like I don't even like saying it because if I'm like, yeah, I beat my depression naturally, people think I'm like, going into the woods with a crystal and rubbing my rib or something. No, I'm just focusing on results and real reasons for why I wasn't home the way I was feeling. And I'm not saying I'm an anti-doctor, but most doctors don't spend very much time studying nutrition. And there's a lot of things out there. I used to work in a clinical research facility, so I also saw behind the scenes of these drug companies. But there's been a bunch of studies done. One showed that there's a bunch of false claims done by the advertising by drug companies that are exaggerated and misleading. There's uh, even, they did a study on physicians that the physicians, the most, the drug they receive the most promotional material about is actually the drug they prescribe the most. And even in that same situation, those same doctors prescribe more expensive medications more often, even if cheaper medications that work are available. Not to mention there's a whole bunch of stuff that shows, you know, placebos, perform better than antidepressants, and that people with antidepressants have a worse outcome in the end, sometimes when those not prescribed them, but I'm not trying to scare anybody if you're taking them. And there's also uh, chemicals like 5-HIAA, that when you take antidepressants over time, they show those levels actually decrease. And chemicals like 5-HIAA are very critical to well-being, some say even more critical than just levels of serotonin alone. So we're constantly bombarded with messages that depression is just this thing you get and you got to take medication for it. And I'm not against antidepressants, but I don't think they're skills either. We shouldn't just be dishing them out as easy as we are because there's serious things like dependency and withdrawal in my case. I know a guy who took Nardil for 30 years and he has horror stories trying to get off of that. So basically, you have to start exploring all your options and don't just listen to the message we hear in society about what depression is. So the number one question I'm actually asked by people is, is it possible to beat depression? So most people, I tell them like, yeah, I used to be depressed, I know people used to be depressed and beat depression, but, but, but yet everyone still asks me, they're like, but is it really possible to beat depression? Like, can I actually beat depression? I was told I was gonna have a disease and I'd have to take medication for the rest of my life. That's what they said to me. They would look at me and I said, TJ, you have a disease. You have to take medication for the rest of your life. And I went from drug addicted, suicidal, hearing voices in my head, dependent on medications, to feeling great with no medications at all. And so we never read or hear about the success stories with depression. It like when Robin Williams killed himself, all of a sudden all these people started emailing me like, hey, Robin Williams couldn't do it. I can't do it. And to me, when, when that happened, as sad as it was, that's just one instance, that's just one person. We don't even know what was going on in his life with being a celebrity with all that pressure. We have no idea. But whenever something like that happens, it stands out. 
And we're not born Prozac deficient. There's always a cause. And basically, for most people in depression, they're kind of stuck in this limbo. They know they're depressed, but they're not quite sure how to beat it. They're not quite sure they can. Maybe they're not quite sure they want to. And that's why I got lucky. Because at that point, when I wrote that suicide letter, I was forced into an open mind. I was determined to do whatever it took to figure it out. Like, no one was coming to save me. I knew that uh, if I didn't do anything in a year, I was going to kill myself. So in a way, I got lucky, because not everyone has that kind of like, all right, this is it type of mentality, but that's what happened to me. And so forgetting all the positive thinking, let's just think reality thinking. So if we're basing it in reality, based in reality, it is possible to beat depression. There's so many people that beat depression, but on the news, you're not going to see like white male in Utah slowly heals his depression over one year and says he's happy now. You know, you're not going to see that on CNN. And uh, by definition, depression tells you it can't be beaten. The filter of depression in your head tells you you can't beat it. It's depression. That's depression in and of itself. And when I really started to realize the possibility of beating depression. I know this might sound crazy to some people, but I was like starting to feel better and actually feel pleasure in life. And I remember I was driving to my class, I was just kind of driving. I kind of look over and there's a sunset in the corner of my eye and I was like, whoa, what's that? And I like pulled over and I'm just sitting there staring at the sunset. And I was like getting all this pleasure from I was like, yeah. Oh, that's why people are talking about sunsets. Like my whole life, I didn't know. Like people were sitting there staring at sunsets. I don't get it. But at that point, I was like, "Oh yeah, like, I'm down for this. I feel good." And that's when I was like, "Okay, I feel good. I know what it's like to not be depressed anymore." And going on with that, again, depression is not the problem. It's a symptom. So for the longest time, I thought depression was something I had or it occurred to me. And so how I stay relapse free now is if I ever start to feel bad, before I start to feel bad, I'd be like, this depression's got me, like this dark cloud's taking over my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm screwed, and then it'd be like two weeks to a month, I'd be just out, out of commission. I just felt like, okay, depression's got me, I'm screwed, nothing I can do. Like it was this thing, a presence in and of itself. But now, if I start to feel down, I simply just start, I just, oh, okay, I'm feeling down. So what does that mean? Like, there's been some times where I start to feel down and I like think about I've only been sleeping five hours every day. Or sometimes I'll start to feel down like, uh, but I've been eating a bunch of tortillas at the afternoon, you know, so I've been sneaking on the gluten thing and I put that back out. So there's always a reason for why you get depressed. But just a few people I know, there's a lady named Maria, she's taking medication, talk therapy, exercise, positive thinking, and she's still severely depressed. And I was, I was like, hey, try cutting out bread. She's like, no, no way. I love bread. If I, was, if I stopped eating bread, my life sucks. I'm like, just try it for two weeks. Just try it. I quit thinking in your head. Just try things and see the results. She stopped eating bread. Turned out, she found out she's vitamin D and iron deficient. Turned her cortisol was through the roof, so her adrenals were a little messed up. She fixed those issues. She feels great now. Another guy I knew. I was addicted to Xanax forever, and he'd always wake up every morning feeling suicidal. Just had him try this amino acid L tryptophan, and all of a sudden he was sleeping good and he didn't feel suicidal anymore. And even some people, there's, uh, can you just be as, as simple as a B12 deficiency? You, all it could be is just you're deficient in B12. You start taking B12, you feel better. I'm not saying everything's that simple, but I'm just showing you what can be possible. And just some things to throw out at you. There's, here's some things you, that can cause depression. Hypoglycemia, thyroid issues, adrenal fatigue, pyroluria, inflammation, uh, neurotransmitter depletion. There's different types of depression. So a lot of people that are uh, low in serotonin, it's more low self-esteem, like self-hatred, like doomsday thinking, I hate myself, everyone hates me. But then there's the other type of depression where you're not motivated, you have no enthusiasm, your emotions are flat. So one type is you're crying all the time, you hate yourself, the other is you're just flat and nothing feels good. There's different types of depression, there's different things going on. And so really, with depression, instead of seeing it as this thing, what I do is I see depression as a compass. I see it as, 
okay, I'm feeling depressed, what's going on? Like I listen to the depression, like where, where, what's, what's getting messed up in my body or going on in my life that's causing me to be depressed? So when I start to get depressed, I don't see it as this dark cloud taking over me. I see it as a sign, a symptom that something needs to be changed and then the depression will go away. And if you think about it, reacting negatively to an unhealthy environment or problems is a natural or normal response. So if I'm vitamin D deficient, have adrenal fatigue, magnesium deficient, and I'm allergic to gluten and dairy, yeah, I'm going to feel, I'm not going to feel good. But for some reason, we think that depression is a separate thing that I had rather than a symptom of all those other precursors to why I was going depressed. So you guys want just some basic stuff to throw out at you that you can start doing to fix depression? You guys doing okay? All right. So, obviously, eat real food. Sounds obvious, but back in the day, I was bombarded with all that low-fat type stuff. Go ahead. The brain is nearly 60% fat. I started taking fish oil, eating avocados, nuts, extra virgin, extra virgin olive oil, butter, and I just started eating tons of fat. Just went crazy, and I started feeling awesome. I even did an experiment. I was like, well, doesn't fat make you fat? And I actually ate like 70% of my calories with fat, and I, I got ripped, I had like a six pack. So if you're not eating any fat, I would just suggest eating a lot more healthy fats. Not all fats are created equal. Another thing I really made it a goal was to, to eat high quality protein every single meal, because the building blocks for neurotransmitters are amino acids, L-tryptophan, tyrosine, so I just started eating some grass-fed beef, eggs, fish, whey protein powder, beans, whatever healthy source of protein you like. And I really made it a goal to eat protein every single meal. As far as carbs, you know, the frosted meaty wheats, it's time to get rid of those guys. And I started eating different stuff like quinoa, sweet potatoes, and then I got obsessed with vegetables. And I'm sensitive to sugar, so I limit my fruit intake, but a lot of people can eat tons of fruit. Feel good. And just some random things. Be careful with caffeine. It depletes B vitamins. It can inhibit serotonin and melatonin production. Uh, some people got to be careful with alcohol because it depletes B vitamins. Also, can contain lots of sugar and wheat. Uh, definitely stay away from hot dogs and those crazy meats that we don't even know what's in them. And one thing that surprised me was vegetable oils. So I always thought canola oil was extremely healthy, but uh, vegetable oils actually contain high amounts of omega-6 fats, which are unstable, oxidize easily, can bring down your mood. And really interesting studies found that uh, Scandinavians have a genetic inability, most some of them have a genetic inability to manufacture chemicals from GLA into PGE1, which is associated with depression. So the GLA in vegetable oils, a lot of Scandinavians, if you have Scandinavian roots, can't even process it efficiently. So basically, nutrition is the foundation for mental health and feeling great. And I've basically come to the conclusion that if someone's unwilling to change their nutrition, they basically don't know how good you can feel or they haven't felt enough pain from depression to change. I, I, a lot of people will feel bad and I'll tell them about, oh, well, you know, have you tried not eating you know, meatball subs? every day and trying to eat some salads or something like that. And I was like, no, no. And I just realized they just they just don't know how good they really can feel. Uh, this as a joke, some some of my friends say I, I act like I'm on cocaine a lot of the time. And it's just basically from eating healthy. And then just some <laughs> random stuff. Things you most likely are deficient in if you're depressed. B vitamins, magnesium, vitamin D, vitamin C, your omega to three to six ratio can be off. And if you have gut problems, you can fix that, probiotics or digestive enzymes. And then just some random things, if you haven't heard of them before, is L-tryptophan 5-HTP is actually the natural precursors your body uses to produce serotonin. Things like L-tyrosine, DLPA, or L-phenylalanine can produce catecholamines. And there's certain uh, things like GABA, some people have mixed results. Certain things that can be calming in Sammy or St. John's work can improve a lot of people's moods. And that's just some basic tests you can do if, you, uh, if you're depressed and you kind of just don't want to try to figure out yourself. 
some basic tests you can just go and get done most of the time it's really cheap just complete blood count blood sugar vitamin d pyroluria all those things are common in people with depression we just don't know it and everyone knows about exercise active relaxation and then uh, random trends worth mentioning i have so many people emailing me that their the problems all along just had to do with digestive problems so they fix their ibs their leaky gut candida and then they're not depressed and something just i was going to throw out there see if anyone comments and I actually have a lot of guys emailing me saying porn is making them depressed so if you're depressed too just get all support you can just screw it just get as much help i don't care just go for it just get support groups therapy do whatever it takes to find your root cause and stay depression free and i promise you it's possible to beat depression so you can email me at tj dominatedepression.com and then there's some resources the mood cure by julia ross is the book that basically saved my life that's the book that got me off antidepressants and uh, basically nutrient therapy the book i thought was yes but actually saved my life so there's some resources some nutritionists at the end and then we can either if you guys want to ask me any questions we can do that now or whatever works if you guys have any questions for you specifically yeah ask them now well i missed the beginning of the, the presentation yeah but um you didn't say so much at least more like more or less situational yes like how that affects yeah i mainly life situation yeah that's a good question so basically he's asking I didn't talk about situational depression and the main reason I focused on all this is with with situational depression I figure that most people already know like hey if I got you know if I break up a girlfriend or I get divorced or something why the depression could be causing it most of the time uh, people that are confused about depression it's these reasons and their life's going good and they have no idea why they're depressed so I specifically focused just on this so I so much to cover like situational depression is a huge topic but there you could be depressed without having these problems just by your life oh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't these things help yes and these things would help people with situational depression so i noticed like as soon as i fixed my depression i was able to do a stressful job i was able to handle all these stressful events that used to just destroy me all of a sudden i was able to just do all these things in life I mean, like eight years ago, I would never just randomly come make a presentation for people at the library. And so, yeah, those things will be like a safeguard. They'll help your brain, body fight against stress and feel better. Does that answer? It answers my question, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Clayton? So, um, uh, I too have been, uh, well, I suspect misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder. Okay. Um, but for the past like, six months, I got a new psychiatrist and they said, oh, well, that's not true. The last guy was wrong. But just for the case and to be safe, and I figured there were no downsides to it, I still was taking my lithium. Are there any downsides yeah. associated with lithium? I don't know what the long term effects of lithium can be, actually. I'm not sure. Do you, do you know what I said? It can cause some major thyroid and long term mm -hmm. disease. Okay. So, so, they, so they say that um, you get regular. Monitor your levels of lithium, and then I think it starts getting more issues. Start getting more issues. You said uh, thyroid and kidney. Yeah. Yeah, I got. I got you where I got kidney testing when I was on lithium as well. When I was on it. Okay. They 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 require to take tests. Yeah, lithium works great for a lot of people, but when I took it, I got. Road rage and try to like chase some guy down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I, stopped, I stopped taking it after a day. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? You got a question back there? Yeah. The VA is really good about passing out drugs. They're fantastic. Oh, the VA? Yeah. Yeah, the VA. But uh, they have to come like 12 different 12 at once? Yeah, just different. I, that's what I'm saying. They're free, you know. <laughs> yes, so, free. Uh, I got tired of them. And uh, like right now, I need 50 milligrams of 90 tests. What would you take? No, 50 milligrams. 
Yeah. Well, I'm listening to my body and not the doctor. I mean, I get they can't figure that out. Yeah. You know, I ate too long away myself, and I never felt better than my life. I was on them. While you were on them, you felt better. No, I just, I just blah, blah, blah. I had more than the rest. I cut it all off and started eating right like here. Yeah. This is okay. Yeah. But I think VA is doing it more harm than good. Yeah, and that's the thing. When I, I work for some of those places, I don't really want to say them specifically. Right. But I thought it was a little crazy because all these people are coming to this group that specializes in mental illness, but all we were teaching them is, hey, if you're depressed, these are the medications you can take. And we're giving them cake and sugar and coffee. And I'm like, why are, are we not talking about all these other reasons for being depressed, and they just want to just give you pills. Like this one guy I knew was taking 20 pills at, at once, and he was in diapers. Like he'd go in a sauna and just crap himself. He couldn't even control his bodily functions. And they're just giving him one medication after another because one medication gave him symptoms, gives him another one. He cut out all the medications and just detoxed his body and ate healthy. And now he's doing awesome. I'm not saying for people to just stop taking their antidepressants or medications. Just exploring those other options because, like you said, you start eating healthy, you take care of your body, and you can feel great just from that alone. I guess my question is I feel better off self describing my antidepressants to take. Oh, choosing your own antidepressants? Well, the milligrams. Yeah. But they have so good to be, you know, I'm getting more depressed, especially when you gotta take 12 pills. That yeah. You don't ever took them. Yeah, that was my experience too. I'd go in with all this knowledge and I know myself and they only talk to me for 10 minutes and they're like, no, you need to increase your dose of selection. I'm like, I don't know. And then the guy for lithium, I told him, I was like, actually, one of my relatives took lithium and he reacted really horribly to it because I tried Lamotrigine instead. He said, no, you need to take lithium. I was like, well, I don't know about it. He's like, no, take lithium. I was like, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> I took it the next day. I'm chasing someone on the road. And I, was like, I think I know myself a lot better than the doctors. Do. Okay, you answered my. That was my question. Okay. Yeah, I feel comfortable and at ease. I'm in a super way. I have. Yeah, I think it should be more doctors working with us as a team rather than doctors telling us what to do. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Motrogen. Yeah. Did you, did you ever try that? That's what never, I, I never got to try it. I was on the road, too, and it made me feel a little certain way, you know, like dry out, and I didn't feel different at all. Oh, like dried out your mouth and everything? No, just dry my mouth. whole body felt dry. Okay. I, was, I, mean, I felt like it was being like a sponge that was completely dry, and you know, I was not hydrated. You know, I drank a lot of water. Yeah, I think it was just like a chemical experience that I felt in my body. The motrogen seems like it's really helped me a lot. But it also changed my lifestyle a lot too, so who knows? Yeah. The connection there. I never got to try it. Yeah. <laughs> Something from <laughs> Yeah, a question. Um, two questions. There yeah. seems to be a lack of transparency in the statistics presented to yeah. the media or people or the public at large or even doctors about what the root cause of depression really are. Yeah. Um, so the question with that is that um, it seems like ad hoc obvious medical school to teach that kind of notion as a more complex issue and of course the problem is the doctors know that they can't just change someone's life spending 20 minutes with them in a room. Um, so I just wanted to know if you knew what type of education they received in medical school from the national average. And then my second point was to comment on the gluten free and I know that it, a lot of times it's a contributing factor but for you, it seems to have been a lot more of a primary factor. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to hear what your ideas were on um, perhaps not really guessing the statistics, but commenting on how much of a primary cause that was for you or it could be for other people in general. So, your first question was how much nutrition do doctors study? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. Well, the educational standards in medical school and I'm not sure. education. It seems to be more of a psychiatrist's job to yeah. get to the root cause of depression, but medical doctors should give them the responsibility of treating depression a lot more at the time with drugs and medications. And yeah. so there's the, 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 the disconnect in the medical community.
here and have a staff and the drug industry of course is pumped by money and circulating issues so I forget the exact amount of hours of a regular doctor is supposed to study nutrition. I think they take one or two classes on it. I'd have to double check. But there's also a lot of other factors going into it. I think a lot of our doctors, if you get your leg cut off, yeah, we're great at getting you in the ambulance and fixing you up. But as far as preventative care, we're not trained to prevent depression. We're trained to just, you get depression, oh, here, solve the symptoms. You, know, you cut your finger off here, fix this. And then you have, the pharmaceutical companies are huge. The two top ones, they're worth way more than Coca-Cola, all those people. And so there's a lot of different messaging going on. And when I worked at the clinical research facility, I did find it pretty interesting. They, I'd see people reacting really negatively to these drugs. But a lot of times they would just kind of, you know, write that off a little bit just so they could pass it. And things, a lot of antidepressants, they just test people for five, six weeks, say, that's safe, you're good to go, and pass the drug. A lot of, I think it's Prozac, the studies is like half of them weren't even published. They only published the beneficial ones. They didn't even show all the negative ones. So I think there's a lot more of a deeper problem going on where we're too obsessed with you got to take medication for this. And doctors don't know. It's not like doctors are bad people. It's just they go in and train, you're depressed, here's a medication. And we just have this idea, I think, as a whole, that depression is this thing that you take medication for rather than a symptom of something else. Does that answer? Uh, who are the Oliver. Oliver. Okay. Yeah. I was to take two on the list. It started getting late. I was depressed over the cost of money and also. Yeah, that almost scared you, man. I I cried every time I see that. Um and, and I missed the first part of it, so I'll have to go back and find out what you said there. But I did come in at the point where you were speaking to the fact that depression is an event comes on versus something that uh, maybe is hereditary or mm -hmm. is clinical in in its uh, root. And I I beg to differ on that, but I want to know where you're um, finding your passion and feeling that. So with the question of whether or not depression has a hereditary and actual clinical aspect, I for me, so many people told me it was genetic. And then a lot of people in my family were had symptoms of depression. And it was just like, yeah, it's genetic, it's clinical. And, and to me, I think when I was beating depression, I wanted to just forget that. I said, I don't care if it's hereditary, I'm going to beat it either way. And to inspire people, I like to say, you know, I don't care if, it's, if you think it's genetic, I think you can still beat it. However, as far as the science goes, I do know if your parents and grandparents have depression, you're more likely to be depressed. I don't know exactly what the science is on like DNA or anything like that. I do know just from learning, seeing people that being depressed, you can learn their behaviors, become depressed yourself. I'm not 100% sure the exact science of whether or not there is like a, a clinical thing where one person that's born is more likely to be depressed. But if, I, if I'm recovering from depression, like even if I did have that genetic predisposition with genes, so they turn on under certain circumstances and, and express themselves in different ways. And with that, if you are able to figure out, like maybe there's something else going on, there might be some other things going on where your genes are expressing themselves, you can fix depression. And if your main goal is to fix depression, I'd rather focus on what I can do to beat it rather than worrying so much if I had a genetic genetic predisposition, but I am not 100% sure what the science says about it. Well, and, and, and a follow-up, I guess, point two would be, um, at, at some point, the, the community feels as if depression is a dangerous thing, we don't want to admit it, we don't want to talk about it. It's, I think if it were labeled something like um, TJ syndrome, we might actually, <laughs> you know, talk about it more or not be quite so straight yeah. of it. Oh, but but okay. it's really not something like alcoholism or addiction no. you have to break. I mean, yep. it's not something you can just push through. And, yep. and so it's, it's a real private thing for a lot of us. 
Yeah. Because I don't want to hear, oh, just get over it. I don't want to hear that. Yeah, just snap out of it. Like, I'm just going to. Woo! Not depressing. Just don't feel that way. Don't feel that way. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to monopolize this, Adam, but. That's fine. But I. How do you feel about that? Is the community acceptance better, the community facing it? And us being able to support each other in a, in a more unified way, yeah. it's probably an absolute shame. And I have a lot to say on that. And Maybe one of the. Maybe tonight at 6 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe eat some healthy food somewhere. But uh, <laughs> one of the things that, with society is we have this disappearance of the word sadness. We don't say I'm sad anymore. One of the problems is, is if someone's feeling down, they're just like, yeah, I'm depressed. Everyone just says they're depressed. We don't even say sad. Like if I'm down, I don't say, yeah, I'm feeling sad. Everyone just says, yeah, I'm feeling depressed. So depressed has become this blanket term. So for someone who's never been depressed, if they feel down, they literally just get up and do some jumping jacks. They're like, it's all right. And they start to feel better. So if someone's like, hey, I'm depressed, they're like, dude, just go run in the sun. But I like to differentiate depression from sadness. Depression is that state where even if you go skydiving, you feel like crap. And then secondly, with this society in general, like the United States, it's more, it's kind of more of like a cold, not cold, but it's very, you got to just produce, you got to work, you got to, there's no, it's like, you. it's just like, a, what's the term for that? Well, I forget the term, but here we don't want to focus on that. We want to focus on like yeah and, and improving business and, and all that stuff and depression. It's like we don't really want to think about that because we want to just keep pushing through and keep feeling awesome. Everything's great. Let's go buy a new car. And so there's a lot of different things coming into play. And before I when I was depressed, I didn't tell anybody. But now I've been doing this. It's just like it feels easy. It's like yeah, I'm depressed. And I just say it so much and so open with it. I don't feel weird saying it anymore. But there is a problem where people confuse depression with what it really is. They think depression is like a moral thing, like you just suck at life or you're not trying hard enough. When it's a real thing that happens, it's a real thing when your brain gets to a point where you fall on the ground and you can't get up for two hours. And so I think it's just a misunderstanding. I also think if you've never been depressed, if you've never been in that state, how would you have really know what that's like? So. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, you mentioned early on that um, you experimented or actually was involved with illegal drugs, right? Yeah. Well, to your depression. Yeah. Now, my experience is different from that, so I was wondering how you. Because I, like, coming from the Philippines, depression is not much. Philippines is awesome. We're a tropical country, you know, we have like, all the big sports, so whatever. Yeah. Um, but coming here to the U.S., I started living in Mass and crazy life, did alcohol, drugs, and all that work for a bar. And then just a few years ago, I just started cleaning up my act, all that. Yeah. Started slowing down. And that's when I started noticing um, seasonal depression. So I would seasonal depression when it would get cold, the sun's not out, I yeah. would like to go out and commit homicide. But <laughs> um, is, with your experience, how was it? That, how was the transition? From getting off drugs? From getting off illegal drugs into <laughs> getting off. Because mine is like, I, I feel like it, it's actually because I'm getting clean, is, that's why I'm being depressed, I'm like sad. Like with drugs. There we have it. Yeah. And when I was getting off drugs, I actually didn't know about all this depression stuff. But as I started getting all this in order, I realized that with drugs, when I was depressed, the drugs were not the problem. The drugs were the smoke on the fire, right? I felt horrible. But I smoked some weed, and all of a sudden I'm enthusiastic about life, and all of a sudden I have energy for life. So I viewed the drugs as they were more... It was like, it wasn't that I was a drug addict, but there's still the withdrawal once you're doing a bunch of drugs where you have to go through that dip to get off them. But I truly felt horrible, so that's why I was using the drugs. And it's now that I've got this 
all this stuff in order, I don't feel like going out and doing drugs. I feel better than when I was using drugs. But, yeah, I was so depressed using drugs and getting off the drugs is like a whole other story in and of itself. But I do, I can say that as you start implementing all these other things to get your body right, your brain heals a lot faster because there's a rewiring process that has to happen with drugs because they change. I think it's in the nucleus that comes the reward circuitry, so it actually associates certain things like drugs or other addictions to more of a survival instinct. So there is some time where you have to rewire, but as you do these healthier things, as you're eating healthy, as you're taking care of yourself, your brain starts to rewire. And I used to think my brain was permanently destroyed from drugs. Like I would, I'd break down. I'd, be like, I'd break down, but I do. I screwed my brain up. You know, I was like. A couple of times I'd smoke like weed with PCP on it, and for like three days afterwards, I would see things in frames for three days, even when I wasn't high. And I was just like broke down crying. I, had, I screwed my brain up. But I can tell you, the brain has an immense capacity for what they say is neuroplasticity, and your brain can rewire itself when you're getting off drugs. So, yeah. Um, Probably at time. If you want probably to. at time. We can take a short break and then. Uh, Woo! Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.